The Parthian Shot by Robert Peel Noble The last note of the baritone's impassioned song had died away. Almost before Mrs. Reynolds had finished the closing bars of the accompaniment, she turned from the piano to the singer. "'You are in fine voice tonight, Charles,' she said, "'but something has given me a headache this evening, and it has been steadily getting worse. "'You will excuse me, I know,' she continued as she arose. "'A night's rest will make me all right.' "'I'm so sorry. Certainly I'll excuse you. Why didn't you tell me sooner?' said Charles Harding as they walked to the door. "'I'll just have a smoke, chat with John before I go, and perhaps he will forgive me for my vocal disturbance. Too bad he doesn't enjoy music,' he added as they went up the stairs. "'Yes, isn't it?' she replied. "'He's like a blind man walking over diamonds. The beauty of music does not exist for him.' She paused before the door of her husband's den. "'Good night,' she said as she moved away. Good night. I hope that you will feel better in the morning, said Charles, turning to enter John's room. Mrs. Reynolds was keenly conscious of her headache as she closed the bedroom door behind her, but she was suffering even more from the memory of that which had caused it. She and Charles were to appear on the program of a musicate on the following Friday evening, and had been having frequent rehearsal. This, it seemed, at dinner that evening, was the cause of her husband's recent fits of sulkiness and of ill humor. Not that he had been a cheerful companion at any time during the past year, but of late he was even worse. And this evening? Why, it was absurd. Her husband was apparently almost ready to forbid Charles the house. The man was jealous. Her husband, actually jealous. She could laugh even now, but for the memory of his stormy words and self-incited anger. What if she and Charles had been engaged at one time? The quarrel over nothing, it is true and her subsequent marriage to John had ended all that, and John should realize it and be more sensible if John could only enjoy music and would be a little more companionable. How long she had been asleep, she did not know, but she awoke in terror. Could it have been the noise of a bursting automobile tire which had so alarmed her that she found herself sitting up in bed before she was fully awake? With a fast-heating heart and with trembling hands, she slipped out of bed and opened the door. John, she called. Then again more loudly. John, oh, John. And ended with a sob. What if, my God, what if he did? She moaned and ran to the open doorway of her husband's den. A piteous, heart-invading scream came from her lips. Not Charles, but John, lay sprawled upon the floor, now stained with blood. Staggering and clutching the banisters, she half ran, half fell, down the stairway, and out through the door to the sidewalk. Help! Oh, help! she screamed. Won't someone help? she moaned. What's the matter? came from the corner across the street as the speaker started toward her. My husband. Oh, help me! she continued to moan. The man who had responded to her call had almost to carry her, half fainting as she was as he accompanied her back into the house. There he managed to get her up the stairs and to the bed which she had left in so great alarm. Where's the telephone? The words were quick, almost curt, passing the open door of Mr. Reynolds' room. He had seen what lay upon the floor. Hall, downstairs, came from the lips whose trembling could not be controlled. Get a doctor, get a doctor. Feeling that she was in greater need of medical aid than was her husband, he ran down the stairs, hurriedly called the nearest physician, and obtained his promise to come at once. He then called another number. Police station. This is Wynn. Send someone here at once. Number 734 Walnut Street. Man killed, I think. Looks like murder. I'll wait here. Running up the stairs again, he found Mrs. Reynolds in the hall, weakly struggling into her kimono and walking with uncertain steps toward the doorway of her husband's room. I must go to him, she cried. Wait he said kindly. If there is anything you can do, I will tell you. But, unheedingly, she followed him into the room and stood pale and open-mouthed, wringing her hands and staring at the form upon the floor over which Wynne was now stooping. We must wait for the doctor, he said gently. He will be here soon. As he finished speaking, Dr. Morris entered. Do something, doctor, quick, cried the frantic woman to the physician already making his examination deftly and silently. After a brief interval, Dr. Morris arose slowly. 
He is past my help, Mrs. Reynolds, he said. You must lie down and let me do something for you. Two men, one a policeman who had come up the stairs while Dr. Morris was helping Mrs. Reynolds to her room, entered the room of tragedy, exchanged words of recognition with Wynne, and listened to the latter's account of what had followed his chance appearance upon the scene. Bullet wound, murmured the second man, who was evidently a city detective and who was inspecting the body and its surrounding. Clothes. Must. Windows locked. Don't find any gun. Guess it's murder, sure enough. Were the outside doors locked when Mrs. Reynolds ran out? Anyone else in the house? I don't know, Johnson, said Wren. You'll have to ask Mrs. Reynolds. Johnson turned to Dr. Morris, who, after administering a sedative to Mrs. Reynolds, had left her in the care of the maid and was now re-entering the room. What do you make of it, doctor? asked Johnson. The bullet, as it seems to be, has entered at a point a little higher than the heart and, judging by the distance to which the blood has spurted, has severed an artery, probably the aorta. The autopsy will determine the matter. One of you had better notify the coroner at once. You do that, Dan, requested Johnson, turning to the policeman. Then he again bent over the body. Hmm, came from him, in thoughtful surprise, as he picked up a half-smoked and broken cigar which had been lying under the edge of the dead man's coat. Portina, he said, reading the name of the brand upon the cigar band. I just wonder. Stepping over to a rather large humidor at one side of the room and opening it, he examined the contents. Three different brands, but no Portinas, he informed Wynne. I must question Mrs. Reynolds. She is very nervous, objected Dr. Morris. Is it necessary to talk to her now? Just two questions, said Johnson, as he went across the hall to the room which he had seen Mrs. Reynolds enter. Mrs. Reynolds, did you find the front door locked as you ran out of the house this evening? he asked. Yes, no, I just turned the knob, she replied. Who was with your husband this evening, Mrs. Reynolds? was the next question. A look of horror swept over her face. He didn't do it. Charles wouldn't hurt anyone, she protested. Charles who? continued the questioner. Charles Harding. But I know he didn't do it. I know he didn't, brokenly asserted Mrs. Reynolds. That remains to be seen. I won't trouble you any more now, though, he said, and returned to the room where the body lay. The doctor had gone. Johnson, having completed his inspection, asked the policeman to await the coroner and went to headquarters. Wynne remained and made an examination on his own account. He inspected all part of the room, peering into places which seemed very unpromising. From under the couch, he picked up a small brass plumb bob attached to a string, regarded it thoughtfully, and put it into his pocket. Quietly, he left the house. The next morning, as he was about to leave his apartments, Wynne received a call from his friend, Charles Harding. Have you seen the morning papers? the latter asked excitedly. No, why? was the reply. Mr. Reynolds has been murdered, and, and I was with him last night, exclaimed Harding. I'm sure I was followed on my way over here. What shall I do? What kind of cigar do you smoke, Charlie? Portinas, said the other, staring. But why do you... Never mind. You go about your business, just as if you were not being followed. You may be arrested, but don't let that worry you too much. I'm going to get busy right away, if that's any comfort to you. Harding shook him by the hand. Thanks, old fellow. I'm glad I've got you to count on. I'll have to go now, said Wynne. The sooner I find out about this, if I can, the better it will be for your peace of mind. While Harding was on his way to his office, nervously aware that he still was being shadowed, Wynne was directing his steps up Walnut Street, absorbed in thought and unconscious of passing acquaintances. At the home of Mrs. Reynolds, he rang the bell. Tell Mrs. Reynolds, he said to the maid, as he presented his card, that it is absolutely necessary for me to see her for a few moments. As Mrs. Reynolds entered, pale and grief-stricken, Wynne arose. I am very sorry to disturb you just at this time, Mrs. Reynolds, but, in the interest of our common friend, Charlie Harding, it is necessary for me to learn everything I can from you which may have a bearing upon your husband's death. Charles couldn't have done such a thing, Mr. Wynne. He is incapable of it. I agree with you, said Wynne. But if I am to clear him before others, I must learn all the facts possible, even those which look damaging. Had you been asleep just before you ran out of the house last night? Yes, 
I had gone to bed with a headache after rehearsing some music with Charles, and he had gone to John's room. You heard no quarreling or noise of a struggle? No, except the noise that awakened me. The shot, I suppose, she added with a shudder. Was there any reason why your husband and Charlie Harding should have quarreled? Mrs. Reynolds hesitated, then spoke quickly. There was no reason, Mr. Wynne, unless you would call John's unreasoning jealousy a reason. Charles and I had to practice together a good deal lately, and John didn't like it. Who was in the house last evening, besides you and Mr. Reynolds and Charlie? Only the maid. The other servant, man, doesn't sleep in the house. Had Mr. Reynolds any enemies that you know of? Had he had any trouble with anyone? Not that I... Why, yes, he had. He had to discharge our former manservant for drunkenness. The man became very angry and abusive when he left. What was his name? Carl Hansen. Do you know his address? No, Mr. Reynolds secured him through an employment agency. Is anything missing? Money? Jewelry? I don't think so. Did you find the front door locked when you started out for help last night? Not with the key or with the bolt. I turned only the knob to open the door. The inside knob works the spring lock, so the door must have been locked. And the outside knob? It takes a key to open the door from the outside. Then how could anyone have gained entrance last night, Mrs. Reynolds? The other outside doors and the windows downstairs were all locked. Mrs. Reynolds became even more pale. Did Carl Hansen have a key to the house? Wynne asked. He did have, said Mrs. Reynolds, breathing more easily, but returned it. Couldn't he have had a duplicate made, though? Yes. Now, Mrs. Reynolds, I won't keep you any longer, but I will ask permission to inspect your husband's room again, and perhaps some other parts of the house. Mrs. Reynolds having acquiesced, Wynne first verified her statements as to the locks on the front door, and then revisited her husband's room. It was nearly noon before he left the house, walking briskly and with no trace of the absorbed manner which he had brought with him. Late in the afternoon he learned that the autopsy performed upon Mr. Reynolds confirmed the opinion of Dr. Morris, and that the bullet had been found, one of thirty-two caliber. He was also informed that his presence as a witness would be required at the coroner's investigation the next morning. At this investigation, the testimony brought out the fact that Mr. Reynolds had died from the effects of a bullet wound that the condition of his clothes indicated a struggle with someone, that no weapon had been found, that the windows of Mr. Reynolds' room were found to be locked when examined by the officers, that all windows downstairs and the outside doors, except the front door opened by Mrs. Reynolds, were found to be locked when examined immediately after the tragedy, that this front door was also locked against any outsider just before it was opened by Mrs. Reynolds, that the stub of a cigar of the kind smoked by Mr. Harding, had been found broken and under Mr. Reynolds' body, that this brand of cigar was not to be found in Mr. Reynolds' stock of cigars, and in fact seemed not to be on sale at any of the cigar stores of the city, that Mr. Harding was the last person known to have been with Mr. Reynolds before the latter's death, and that Mr. Reynolds had objected to the frequency of Mr. Harding's calls upon Mrs. Reynolds and had entertained an unfriendly feeling toward Mr. Harding on that account. To Harding, who, with pale face, had sat listening intently, the presentation of these facts had been anything but reassuring. His only comfort had been the expression of assurance upon the face of Wynne, who now addressed the coroner. I should like to introduce further evidence. Proceed, was the reply. After the officers who had been sent to the Reynolds house had completed their examination, said Wynne, I made a further inspection of the room where the body was found. Under the couch, I found this, he continued, holding up the object. It is, as you see, a small plumb bob such as is used by masons and carpenters. What, in particular, aroused my interest, however, was the fact that the stout cord attached to the bob had a short piece of thread tied to it at the loose end, and the fact that the plumb bob was found under the davenport, and on a floor which the maid informed me had been swept on the day that Mr. Reynolds met his death. The maid further informed me that she was positive that the plumb bob was not on the floor at the time when the floor was swept, and that she had never seen it before. Although I was unable to see any connection between this plumb bob and the death of Mr. Reynolds, I had the feeling that there was a connection 
and returned to the Reynolds house the next morning with the hope of being able to find it. From what, I asked myself, had the plumb bob been suspended? Why had it been fastened as, apparently, it had been by a thread tied to the cord instead of being fastened directly by the cord itself? And why was it thrown or left on the floor of a room used by a man as orderly as Mr. Reynolds was known to be? These questions I succeeded in answering. I found a short piece of thread tied to the lower end of the vertical tube of the electric light chandelier, which is in the center of Mr. Reynolds' room. I also found that the plumb bob, if it had been attached at this point, would have cleared the floor by about a foot. Just over the chandelier, in the attic above this room, there was a short section of flooring which apparently had been removed, and then replaced, sometime after the flooring had been laid. This I removed, and under it I saw the end of a rifle which had been thrust down into the tube of the chandelier below. Harding sank back into his chair and relaxed with a sigh of relief, but the coroner and the others present continued in their positions of rigid attention. The stock of the rifle, continued Wynne, had been cut off in order to make concealment under the floor possible. The trigger was connected to an electromagnetic device, also concealed under the floor. In the floor of Mr. Reynolds' room is a push-button, supposed to be no longer in use, but that it is connected with the electromagnet above, I proved when, by pressing this push-button, I was able to release the previously raised gun hammer. Gentlemen, in that rifle I found this, said Wynne impressively as he held up another small object. It is the empty shell of a thirty-two caliber cartridge. Your imagination can tell you the rest. Shortly after Charles Harding had left the house, Mr. Reynolds attached the plumb bob to the chandelier and lay upon the floor, so that his heart would be just under the plumb bob, and therefore directly in the line of fire. He pulled the cord, breaking the thread close to the chandelier, of course, concealed the bow and cord by throwing them under the couch, and— with but the slightest change of his position on the floor, pressed the push-button with an outstretched arm. That any living man is responsible for his death, I cannot believe, nor can you, I think, in the face of these facts. It may be more charitable for us to believe that Mr. Reynolds, mentally unbalanced by worry over his impending financial difficulties, known to a few of his friends, sought nothing but relief in death while trying, at the same time, to avoid the stigma of the suicide, but it is difficult not to entertain the idea that Mr. Reynolds, actuated by jealousy, purposely removed Charles Harding's cigar stub from the ashtray to the floor, purposely disarranged his own clothing, and purposely chose that time for pressing the push-button when the bullet which was discharged into his own body should also serve as a Parthian shot at the man who had been in his room but a few minutes before. Wynne's evidence led to an immediate verdict of suicide, and everyone hastened to shake Harding's hand. Although Harding held no one's hand in as long a grasp as he held Wynne's, his eyes rested often upon the black-gowned figure of Mrs. Reynolds, whose face expressed relief as well as grief. Was not something else fleetingly expressed there, too? Gladness? Joy? Harding started toward her as she was about to leave the room, then checked himself abruptly. Better wait, he thought, and turned again to Wynne. The End